there's a few folks I think still coming because I know at least two of them that aren't here. But we'll get started uh, with some of the preliminaries and then I'll introduce the speakers. Um, so we'll start with uh, Mike McGinn uh, to come up and talk a little bit about the Next Generation IT Club. Um, the Next Generation IT Club sponsors the uh, pizza and pop networking session that follows the speaker series. So I want to give them uh, a warm thank you. And Mike's going to tell you a little bit about the club. So. Hi, thank you all for coming today. Thanks for yes, for spending some time with us today. Uh, my name is Michael McGinn, and I'm the president of the Next Generation IT Club here at college. We've been in uh, the club for two years now. Um, we do um, workshops and so forth on uh, up and coming IT information uh, skills and so forth. And we offer some interesting uh, services for the students, uh, a project website. Uh, where they can uh, upload their their class projects and build a portfolio over the, the two years that they're here or longer, depending on what programs they're taking. And uh, we're putting together a, a student hosting uh, service. Uh, we're still working out the details on how that's going to happen, but hopefully we'll get it up and running by next quarter. Got some flyers here to up. And I just wanted to uh, invite you all to come out to a meeting. Uh, we have meetings every Wednesday from 11 to 1 p.m. in CC3, uh, 234. And with that, I'll turn it over to Brian. Introduce our speakers, and we'll get on with the uh, event. Great. And uh, spring quarter, uh, look for a uh, uh, tech fair. Oh, yes, the tech fair. Uh, so. Yeah, it's still, still in the works. Uh, sometime toward the end of spring quarter, we'll have about a four-hour event after the last speaker series. Um, we'll have some demonstration uh, software set up and some hardware set up. So folks that want to get some hands-on experience with playing with machines and some of the software and stuff like that, we'll be able to. Wednesday, uh, the meeting's Wednesday, uh, 11 to 1. Eleven to 1. Eleven to 1. And CC2, 134. Um, well, thank you all for coming. It's my pleasure to introduce our speakers uh, from Coal Fire. Uh, so Rick Norman and Tom McAndrew are here today to talk to us, uh, about the work that they do. Um, Rick um, has been, it says here, 25 years of experience in the uh, IT security field, working in, with businesses to help them be sure that their data is secure. Uh, he's, um, Worked on teams addressing uh, information security threats and compliance risks, um, I, working with identity and access management, data loss prevention, and security information event monitoring. Rick Norman, here. And Tom McAndrew, um, your, your role at Coal Fire is currently as the director. I manage our professional services. Yeah, professional services. And um, we met Tom also in, under his role as um, the current president of the Seattle chapter of the Information Systems Audit and Control Association, the ISACA. All right. Got it right. Practicing all the So, uh, and that's this uh, professional organization that really deals with a particular aspect of information security and all the complex. Uh, is, is 
part of that group. And so part of that, what you've done is I've reached out to about a half a dozen of those folks, and those are the speakers that you guys are going to see here for the next uh, couple weeks. So hopefully some of those speakers will be valuable for you guys and can provide the input. So Rick Norman here, before I snag him over to Coal Fire, uh, he worked at Costco for 25 years and that, that was an information security uh, manager there and did a bunch of things. And so hopefully you can kind of see that a lot of these guys are uh, in a lot of different positions. Most of the folks I'm working with love what they're doing uh, and we're, uh, you know, we're fortunate, but also kind of probably have some common things that help them kind of get where they're at. So uh, with that, I just kind of wanted to start with, uh, with what started me on my career was, it wasn't that long ago, it was about 15 years ago. Uh, you know, I, I've always been a, a, a technology person video games or iPads or you know the next thing that's coming out. And I remember thinking in the, in the mid 90s, uh, I didn't know really what I wanted to do with myself. And I thought, I knew a little bit about security. And I thought that was something that I probably wanted to do. So the first thing that I did is I reached out uh, to a friend of mine that was at Microsoft. And I said, hey, do you know someone that's in the information security field? Can I just have lunch with them and talk to them? So that was what I first did back then. And that person was, uh, was great. They provided some input to me and gave me some guidance on what sort of certifications they did sort of jobs they have. And, and uh, while I was doing that, I was also looking at some other group houses that I thought were great, but after I talked to those people and saw what they did, it turned out not to really be something that you know was lying to me. So one of the first things I did was, one, I, I tried to find what I wanted to do, and then I connected myself with people that were doing what I was doing, asked them how they got there, uh, and then um, I've been lucky to have just a, a bunch of mentors that helped me kind of get to where I want. Uh, and so even within that, you know, through, through college, uh, I wasn't really a computer science major. I decided to be an economics major. I still didn't really know exactly what I wanted to do with an IT. Uh, I went to Naval Academy and graduated. And it was really with my time in the, in the Navy uh, that I really learned that uh, computer security and information technology was what, was what, I, was, what, what, uh, what I was interested in. Um, yeah, I did a couple different, uh, a couple of deployments in the Gulf, and uh, I was in charge of the display. So if you go like any aircraft carrier or see it, big displays that all the you know the decision makers are looking at. Well, the, the good news is I was in charge of those displays, so I had a lot of visibility within the ship. The bad news was they were displays. If there's anything wrong with them, I I was uh, tasked to figure out what was wrong, and it didn't matter whether it was my stuff. So <laughs> if I had bad data that was fed in, uh, you know, if the ship's gyro was off, if there was electrical signals that were off, if the encryption technology was off, it didn't matter. My job was to figure out how to make the display accurate. So that's really what kind of you know launched me into kind of understanding this kind of holistic view of IT security and all the different components that feed into things. And so I was very lucky to get experience from satellites to radios to military frequencies to electrical engineering and gyroscopes and, and all that uh, fun stuff. So that kind of allowed me to get together and that allowed me to kind of take my next job, which was dealing with uh, interoperability. And so the, the next position I really had within the Navy was uh, the Navy. If you, if you aren't aware, the Navy had a, a bunch of IT, major IT failures in the 90s. Um, and actually it started out probably early in 1987, there was a Navy warship. The only, the only ship we've ever had that's been attacked in the United States successfully from an anti-ship missile was the Stark. Uh, and in 1987, uh, Iran and Iraq were fighting each other. The Stark got attacked um, and uh, it got hit by two missiles. And with all the technology that it had aboard, guess how they detected that the missiles were Somebody was on the boat. 20-year-old kid on the front of the boat looked out, saw a missile coming in, and, and it hit the ship. Uh, you know, of course, they killed about 27 sailors, but from that, the Navy kind of realized that you know the technology was only as good as how it was being implemented. Um, and, and a year later, as the tensions kept growing, the, the Navy put a bunch of technology on ships. And in 1988, the Ascend, uh, which is a Navy cruiser, accidentally shot down uh, an Iranian commercial airbus. Uh, and that was because what they've done is they've, they've put in all this technology, they hadn't trained people how to use it. Um, there's some technical flaws and there's some human flaws, and they basically, from the weapon systems, they believed that it was a, a, a MiG, or a, a, an Iranian aircraft that was coming down and attacking the, the warship. The ship was already kind of under attack by some small gunboats. Um, you know, they, they shot some missiles and, and, and did that. So that was another part that from the Navy, you know, they kind of learned from those lessons. Not having technology enabled was a big deal. Having enabled too much uh, could cause issues. And then in the 90s, they started using uh, this great unit technology called Windows NT to start uh, streamlining the engineering plans. And as they started replacing kind of old technology with new technology, they found out that the software bugs, so there's a basic buffer overflow that they, they had that was a, a 
a issue within a, a ship, and it basically took the whole ship out of commission for two years. So we lost a multi-billion dollar, you know, uh, cruiser uh, from a deployment because of a software bug uh, in how a ship integrated and the ship could move. So those are some of the lessons that the Navy learned that as I was starting to work, you know, get on, I was able to work with a lot of people and understand how the Navy did compliance and why it was so important and how they deal with double security. And I realized that was a good niche for me because I didn't want to, I remember thinking about that when I was sitting around deployment thinking what I really wanted to do when I got out of the Navy. I thought I really don't want to in technology where another 18 year old kid is going to spend more time, be better than me, probably willing to do stuff for less money than me. I wanted to find a unique niche that would kind of differentiate myself from some other folks. And so security was one that I, that I kind of plugged on to and it, and it turned out to be, that could be great. Um, so as part of that, you know, I went back to school again and I got my master's of IT in information technology. And at the time, there wasn't a lot of um, information security classes. I mean, this is even just like a, you know, a decade ago. Um, there wasn't a lot of information security classes. There were general IT classes, and there might have been some kind of subsets. Um, and what I did is I picked a, uh, a school at the University of Maryland. They had this class that, that was called the NSA Center of Excellence. So they were just starting to establish those, and now they have dozens of those schools now around. And so that's where I got some formal training in information security. Uh, and then when I got done with that, I was, I was getting ready to graduate, and I thought, you know what? I really needed to kind of round out another another part that I had. So I was an economics major, I was an IT security guy, and uh, I realized that more and more of my interactions, my value was more that I could take complicated technical issues and troubleshoot those with business managers and other owners. And I realized the area that I was missing in my life there was the, the business side of things. So I went back to school again here at the University of Washington, and I got my MBA. And for me, that, that's what turned out to be a great deal. Because what I'm finding um, is that right now, people that can write well, understand technology, and you know, can have a regular conversation are in very high demand right now. Uh, you know, there's a lot of technical people that can write. There's a lot of people that can write that doesn't know the technology. And there's a lot of people that can do both but don't understand kind of the fundamentals of a business or something like that. And so you know, one of those things that would be kind of my advice to you guys as you guys are looking at how to expand your career is we're going to naturally kind of tend to one of those kind of three areas. Um, and within them, what I'm finding is that people that can learn to kind of overcome in some of the areas that they aren't strong on. Like for me, it was writing. I, uh, if you look at my SAT scores, my math was very good and my writing was not, not, very, not very good at all. And part of that was I'd never read really growing up. I played with computers and I did that stuff. <laughs> and I didn't like reading books. Uh, and I thought it was interesting because when I took the GMAT, uh, which is for the MBA class, I, I, you know, I, I didn't even study math. So it only goes up to like geometry. So I didn't think I'd even need to do it. And I was interested because this was maybe, you know, Eight years after I took my my uh, um, uh, my SATs, my scores were flip flop. But I realized within the last five or ten years, my strengths were not really around math and quantitative analysis, but more of kind of the softer skills. Which I so as part of that, when I was getting out of the Navy, I was trying to decide, well, what do I really want to do with my life? I, I travel all around the, the country and the world, and I, you know, I grew up here, and uh, I wanted to move back here with my wife, and she wanted to go back to school. So. I made a decision to, uh, to jump into the commercial side. I didn't want to be pigeonholed and just being a military guy or just doing stuff with the DOD. I wanted to uh, kind of expand my horizons. And so um, what happened is uh, the president of our company, who was a, a West Point grad, reached out to me when I was looking around. He said, hey, do you want to, uh, you want to join this small company called Coal Fire? Me and the other uh, co-founders you know, started this a couple years ago. Uh, we've, this is our seventh business, business. We've done this a lot of times. You can come and join. Be a wild ride. You're gonna work really hard, but you'll learn a whole lot. And so I joined, you know, Full Fire six years ago, uh, and we had I think about you know 20 people. We had two offices. The Seattle office had like five people. Uh, today we have over 100 people. I've hired 30 people just to report to me within the last six months, uh, and I'm planning on hiring another 150 uh, in the next uh, two years. Uh, we went and got some venture capital funding, so I got five million dollars venture capital funding. So that was always an area that intrigued me is, you know, what does it take to grow, to grow a business uh, and to work with people that have done that before? So I've been able to do that kind of in, in, in my niche as well uh, here today. So as part of that, you know, I'll, uh, I'll kind of turn you over to Rick, but what I just kind of wanted to share my experience, but I've been very fortunate to kind of do what I'm doing, um, and I think really a lot of it has been um, just, uh, just the great people that I've been able to, to network with. Um, I know that's something that's very difficult for folks to, to do. I know a lot of people that are looking for jobs and say, I'd like to network, but I don't know how. Uh, or like I'm in LinkedIn and I see LinkedIn requests from people that I have never heard of or, or never met. Um, and the good, good part is you guys are already kind of in a community. You've already got people that have some similar um, 
skill sets or some similar things that you like to do. And these can be things from going outdoors and going hiking or doing something, but I can't tell you uh, how driven my life has been because I've just been so fortunate to have different mentors that have been able to kind of, you know, spend time with me, invest the time, and uh, that's what I'm hoping to do here. Whatever I can do to kind of share my experience and uh, give you guys any advice, I'd be more than happy to do that. So before I move on to that, the best advice I can give you is from Rick Norman. So uh, I, I, uh, I convinced Rick, you know, I, I, I'd been talking with him for several years when he was over at Costco. And, you know, as, as, as Coal Fire was growing, I've always been kind of like looking to figure out, you know, who, who might be another good fit. And uh, I was very fortunate to, uh, to, to convince Rick to come join our team. Uh, how long ago that was now? About four months. Four months. So four months ago, you know, after 25 years mostly working with, within Costco, Rick decided to leave and, and come join our, our, our company. And so that was something that was very you know, satisfying to me, people that have been doing a career, that have been somewhere, very well established, um, you know, in companies like Costco, uh, were looking to make that change and join a small company that we had. So that was something that was nice to say, to, to build a company and do that, and have the challenge is obviously retaining guys like Rick and then building a career path for folks like Rick so they can kind of expand and grow their career. So Rick will talk about it, but you'll see a year from now, hopefully Rick will be uh, leading our uh, San Diego office if we're expanding and growing up. With that, I'll uh, turn it over to you, Rick. Yeah. I'll go ahead, uh, assuming if you do uh, participate in LinkedIn, I'm going to leave my business cards up here. Uh, my email address is pretty easy, but still, I'll leave these here. Feel free to take it um, and use it uh, you know, how you see fit to better yourself. Before I get too far into this, what I'd like to do is just kind of Kind of hear from you, pull the, the audience here. What what are you here for? Why are you at Cascadia? Yeah. I'm here to uh, develop my web application programming skills. Okay. Right. So that I can implement uh, applications on web based uh, devices and mobile devices and so forth. Okay, great. Anybody else? Okay. I don't know where it would fit best, but it's not amazing. So it's pretty, pretty intriguing technology, isn't it? But yeah, until you start getting your feet wet and all you don't really know which way you want to migrate to or your strengths are going to be. Okay. All right. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I'm learning web apps. Also, I have been involved in SQL. I have watched it develop it together.
a science teacher who had a passion for science and technology, he comes back, this is in San Diego County, he comes back because San Diego State had one of the top three in the country optics and lasers program. So he comes back, has this material, I get all jazzed about it, and so from that moment on, I plot my course to go get my degree in physics. Now I had to get it in physics because that's where the program existed. Other places um, in Georgia, I'm forgetting what that college is out there, there's a, a famous college in, in, uh, in Atlanta uh, that had that program as well. But it's typically you'll find it in the electrical engineering. You have to become a double E. Somewhere in the engineering sciences is where that, that lies. But in San Diego State, it was in the physics department. So I'm going to be a physicist. That was my plan. Okay. So I'm here in high school. I start off, I went to a community college. So I have. So as Tom has things that he's passionate about and he's had people kind of mentor him at different times, uh, mine's not quite the same. Um, I'm the first college graduate in my family tree. So I start off, I end up having, just as a, as a timeline, in my senior year of high school, I, I started the community college and I end up with an AS degree. Because I'm gonna transfer as a junior to San Diego State. So I, I figure out, plot everything. What do I need to take? What are the minimum courses? Hopefully I don't have to take any English uh, <laughs> and so forth. Well, I ended up taking one of the best classes of my life and it was a remedial English class. It was like um, English 90, I think. And that's where I really learned some of the fundamentals that I was lacking. I, I had the math. This one, as soon as I started here, my first math class was calculus because throughout I had you know, been focused on math science, thought English wasn't important. As Tom described, there's some people that are good in the technical, there's, but don't under, they, they can't write to save their life. There's other people that are great writers, but they don't know the technology. Okay, I was more on the technology side, but couldn't write. Uh, you do end up having to write <laughs> if you, go into kind of the heavy sciences because you end up writing papers, you write a senior thesis. Um, if you get an advanced degree, you've got to write a master's thesis. So writing is important. Um, and I'm, I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir in this case. But I get my AS degree. So two-year colleges are, are uh, I think, a critical um, component to an education for many of us, uh, especially if you don't have the money to go to an expensive four-year college. So I get my AS degree, transfer as a junior to San Diego State, and I end up getting my bachelor's degree. This time period is six years. Six years total for me to get my BS in physics. Now, I was working, I've been working since I was like 15 and a half. Uh, and so I was working 30, 35 hours a week going to school and trying to manage all of that.